Peace, family. Hope everyone is doing well this Sunday morning. And again, I want to thank you all for this bullpen and join us on another conversation. So before we get into today's uh, topic, I definitely want to encourage you to, uh, you know, to like this program, to share this program with your family and friends. And I know even though it's a Sunday, and many of you are about taking care of your Sunday business, whether it's going to church, spending time with family. But if you have a moment, definitely take your time out to, uh, you know, to come inside the bullpen. It's going to be a great topic this morning, a great conversation. I want to welcome you all. I hope you all have had a great week and even more, I would say, even a better and peaceful weekend. So it's a very special morning, very special day. Today I have my big brother with me, uh, Brother Tyrone Little. He's going to tell him a little bit about himself. We're going to get into the topic. So the topic of the day is we're talking about life after life in prison, the psychological effects of long on long-term offenders. It's a great topic. We had a conference yesterday at Coppin State University. We made sense, you know, practical as well as clinical and education experience. And we're really going to get dive deep into some of these hard issues. So I want to welcome you, Yara. Thank you for showing up this morning, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. And uh, just for the... I really appreciate it. I thank everybody for this. Um, yes, as uh, Dr. Uh, Ragley said, my name is Tyrone Logan. Uh, he and I uh, have been uh, working on a very amount of subject matters collaboratively. Uh, he spoke a little bit about the conference, which we probably will be getting in more detail about. Um, my educational background, I have a master's in uh, behavioral science. I'm currently uh, matriculated into the doctorate program to pursue higher education. I've uh, been involved in, in developing various programs. Currently, I'm the senior Reentry uh, specialist for, for the youth yet uh, the yet uh, program, which is youth advocacy program incorporated, and uh, I have uh, developed various various topics on this. I serve approximately thirty eight years in prison, and so when you're talking about the psychological aspects of uh, long term incarceration. I think that what happens is it's a misrepresentation if you do not take the, the biological effects of the population into consideration. And then the, the whole premise of all of this is that you have to deal with it from a psychoeducational approach. So we've been getting into that type of stuff, uh, subject matter. Thank you. And really, thank you for that, brother. So definitely, um, again, you know, call your friends, you know, uh, for the families out there who have, you know, sons or, or husbands or wives or uncles who've been incarcerated, maybe long term, even short term, definitely this is a topic that, that you want to share with them. So as, 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 as Brother uh, Yah is mentioning, you might hear me some Brother Yah Yah, I think Tyrone Little, Little, so throughout you probably hear me saying Brother Yah, but, um, but definitely what he's saying in terms of the long term incarceration, the brother himself who spent, as he indicated, you know, most, you know, decades, you know, you know behind the wall. So we have a wealth of information. So the first thing I want to talk about, y'all, just right here, you talk about the, of course, takes me on 10 years of experience. Prior, before you even got, they began to really understand it from a psychoeducation perspective or became, you know, enrolled in school to even advance your information around it. Just your own personal experience in terms of what, what you notice about yourself after going into prison, relatively a young man, coming home, uh, I would say an, an elder brother, so what were some things you identified with yourself you said was well, something I really need to look into this even more? Mm -hmm. And I think I think that's a very important question. Uh, the reason being is because adverse shareholder experiences is definitely the root and foundation of all of the adverse uh, behaviors that proceeds. Mm -hmm. Meaning that when I was in the community, man, I was uh, ruled by adverse shareholders. Growing up in an environment inundated with all types of violence and crime, the pimps and all of those types of stuff. That's the area I come up with. Yes, sir. And those behaviors, along with my familiar structure, mm -hmm. it's one thing I always say is that trauma begins in the family structure. Okay. Because even when you're trying to break off and establish your own identity, your parents are saying, hey, you can't do this, hey, you can't do this. And that's traumatizing when you want to establish your own identity. Right. So I took to the streets, and I realized that um, 
uh, as a result of, of, of being uh, incarcerated for uh, crimes, man, over and over again, going to different training schools and still repeating the same type of cycle, the same type of behavior. That when you are psychologically educated, meaning that the more knowledge and education that you get about your own life experiences, mm -hmm. then you're able just to accept some things about yourself that you can't change. Right. And not only accept things that you can't change, mm -hmm. you also recognize that you have the power and the potential to remold and reshape your cognitive distortions of reality and mold yourself into becoming a better human and productive, healthy human being. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I went into the system, man, uh, I was faced with a few challenges. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, guys coming into a system, man, that, that ruled homosexuality, right. accepted practice and stuff like that. And someone approached me like that, and I wound up uh, killing them, wound up facing the death penalty. The first inmate in the state of Maryland mm -hmm. was facing the death penalty. Mm -hmm. The only inmate to witness the truth about the death of Herman Tosin, yeah. in the penitentiary, first officer killed in the penitentiary and all. So that was traumatizing too, just the experience mm -hmm. itself. Yes, sir. Me being sentenced to a uh, solitary confinement for 10 years mm -hmm. and facing the death penalty, wind up and get 25 years for something that someone was trying to make me be that I wasn't going to allow. So you, 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 when you talk about the biologic, Mm -hmm. The biological and the psychological effect of incarceration, long term imprisonment. That is one of the key components that research lacking. Mm -hmm. They don't even deal with that. Mm -hmm. It's no module that educate people about trauma. Mm -hmm. And I say that once you're educated about it, because a lot of people are traumatized and don't know the root right. of right. why they do certain things that they do. Mm -hmm. Right. Once you're educated about it, then it gives you opportunity man to remold yourself and just accept mm. some things and not let past experience mm. rule your current life mm. Mm. yes that's that, that's i'm glad you shared that with me because i know that with the people who are still tuning in this morning i'm sure there are some who uh are able to understand when you talk about trump mm. and but and but also i want to like you say for for some people it may be the first time that I'm sure they've heard, they've heard the word trauma before, mm -hmm. but they never really was able to truly understand what trauma is, how mm -hmm. to define. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is just take a moment for the audience, just kind of, and it's not to insult anyone's in intelligence, but but I was always taught that that in, in many times when we use phrases or terminology, people don't really understand what that is. Some people don't. So when we talk about trauma in a very simplistic kind of way, what the brother is referring to is that, and this is according to the American Psychological Association, when they talk about how they define trauma, even though the definition has changed. Well, has changed. Well, now we have the DSM five or the Diagnostic Statistical Manual five. But originally, trauma was defined as as a direct experience. So, what the brother friend, a direct experience, whether it was in the family, whether it was in the prison system, that was a direct experience. But also, he talked about being witnessing, say, in a correction officer being killed in the prison. That's something that he witnessed. But also, I'm sure the brother about story that he. When we talk about trauma, trauma can happen, can impact us in a way that when we physically, when we are in a situation where it is a life threatening situation, a life changing situation, that when our brains begin to identify that as a threat to our being, that something takes place, or we can witness that, or we can hear something of that. So when we talk about trauma, when you when you associate that definition, say with the environment that we live in, was within your family, well, say within within the neighborhood community the community that you live in, you talk about the children, the men and the women every day who witness trauma themselves within their family, family structure. Or they may witness trauma just by walking to the bus stop or walking to the school. Or they may witness trauma by seeing on television. We talk about Freddie Gray, who was murdered, say, I think it was 2015. You know, so all of these events impact trauma. And I'm glad you shared that with me, brother, because it's, let it's me a... Add, let, me yes, add to, let me add to what you're saying in, in light of what you're saying. First of all, um, all the way back from the DMS one mm -hmm. to five, mm -hmm. these are individuals that just basically interpret behaviors and classify behaviors as being pathological, exactly. being some type of disease type mm -hmm. of stuff. 
But one of the major points that you just emphasized is that when you talk about trauma, they make it seem like it's such a uh, uh, perplex mm. because of the language that they right. use. Right. And I think that language is important because right. language defines things. That's right. And so if they don't understand, and this is the reason why it is absolutely necessary to educate, to right. educate That's about right. trauma. Mm -hmm. So trauma, essentially, to add to what you was just saying, Doc, it's like a inner, not only is it a shock to your to your system, mm -hmm. to your uh, uh, you know your fight flight situation because mm -hmm. that's the limbic system, right? And 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 the fight flight is basically by the amygdala, right? You know that control your emotions and all of this like other stuff, mm -hmm. along with other things that make up the uh, limbic system. But it's simply a interruption in your mm -hmm. cognition and right, your thinking, mm -hmm. and it and it has such an impact on on that process of your brain right that you respond to it in, in an over it's a shock to your system mm -hmm. so anything anything that you witness uh, like that mm -hmm. like for example you see in somebody coma mm -hmm. it's a shock to your system that's right that's right and it's trauma that's right and see so so everybody everybody adapt to trauma different that's right Mm -hmm. I might see that, in the, and I'm so used to that. Mm -hmm. You might see it might be horrifying. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to sleep and you stay and say, oh, my God, dude, I can't believe right, that this. Right. right? Because people respond differently to trauma. That's right. When you're talking about long-term incarceration, and you're talking about a person returning back to society, mm -hmm. to a family, like we discussed in the conference yesterday, mm -hmm. he or she is returning back to a family that they don't even know That's and right. that don't even know them. That's right. And then when they they see all of these different forms of behaviors, that begin to traumatize the family. That's right. That begin to affect the children, the mother, the wife, because they don't know who that person is. And that person don't understand who they are. That's right. Mm -hmm. So what you do is in an education type of system, you talk about those types of things. Mm -hmm. You sit around and you talk because that's revealing how you feel about things. And mm -hmm. then the root of all of this is rooted in cognitive distortions. That's right. Mm -hmm. Your brain is, is it persistent. It, mm -hmm. it can change. It can restructure itself. Mm -hmm. And because it can restructure itself, if, you, if you're looking at your life cycle in a negative way, mm -hmm. by participating in negative behaviors to suppress the trauma. Right. Whether right. it's prostitution, drugs, mm -hmm. murders, all this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's rooted in trauma. Mm -hmm. And once people are educated about it, mm -hmm. then they can begin to restructure, right. refresh in their mm -hmm. brain. But they're educated. Mm -hmm. You got uh, people out there today that don't understand what their biological traumas are. Right. They go to the doctor, and the doctor speaking, like you said, doc, mm -hmm. in a language they, they don't even understand. Right. But they don't understand it. So when you educate people mm -hmm. about the trauma, mm -hmm. that's a powerful solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It really is. It really is. And I'm glad that, I'm glad the brother is, is, is sharing it with me because, you know, often we hear the phrase, in, you know, Malcolm said, you know, education is your passport. Uh, but many, but, but. Also, with W. D. Du Bois talked about education as being a way of, of 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 advancing you, you know, in the system that we live in, in a way that allows you to free yourself. But in the way that the brothers interpret education, meaning that, unfortunately, for many of us, we have been misinformed, or there's been a a, a lack of information we've been exposed to. So we hear these terms, we live these, you know, we have these lifestyles, but we're not familiar with many times many of the effects of the lifestyle that we're living. So as his brother Andy came, we talked to come into a doctor's office and he's talking about certain things, you know, biosocial or biological effects they have on, you know, we nod our head because sometimes we're embarrassed. We don't want to appear as if we don't know. Many times we don't know. So we're afraid to ask questions about this. But the brother shared education is the key component. And that's one. That's just one of the things that's missing from our community is the educational piece, because many times what has happened is uh, people come into the community. And they offer these ideas about what can help the community, but it's not really taking into consideration, one, that the lack of information that is being uh, 
that the community say is in lack of, but also is trying to define for the community actually what they need. And that's why it's so very important that brothers like like y'all, myself, say who have similar experiences in a way that we're now, we can talk from it from a personal experience and to how it impacts us, but also from an educational experience as well as a clinical experience. We have to begin to, in our community, begin to say, well, okay, what are some of the things that missing? What we're trying to do, what we want, what we're doing is we're filling a gap. Anytime we talk about when you're talking about making a difference, you what you hope, what you're looking for, what 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 is the gap that needs to be filled? Whether whether what whether it may be in you know, the food industry, it could be in the clothing industry. In this particular, in this particular case, we're talking about in the you know in the mental health in our community. So the gap that I'm understanding, what the brothers understand is that well, look, a lot of these brothers and sisters for that matter are being released after long-term incarceration, and we're gonna get into you know, when we talk about, the brother talked about isolation, you know, being confined within the cell. We're talking about sleep deprivation. We're talking about the noise. All of these things impact you, impact the brain in a way that where it does cause a psychological harm to you, if not addressed. Let me, let me, let me, yes, let, me, let, me mm. let me build on what you said. Okay, now, so I was in solitary confinement. Yes, sir. Mm. And it was five cells on one side and five cells on the, on the other side. Guys participating in the most uh, dehumanizing activities that mm -hmm. I witnessed. You know, uh, feces fights and mm -hmm. all that type of stuff. All this basically coming out because of the pain and, and the biologically pain and the psychological mm -hmm. pain that they experience and not having the way with the or the strength Right, fortitude mm. to, to withstand it. So they acting out, they mm. acting out. And I remember I pulled up this uh, this officer named uh, Pop Evans, and I said, I said, uh, Pop, I said, man, man, get me back here with all these crazy guys. Yeah. Mm. He said that. Uh, Let me ask you a question. I said, what's that? He said, how you know that you ain't the one that's crazy mm. and that they know it? Right. <laughs> yeah. You the only one that ain't doing it. Right, right. <laughs> I, I mean, right. it seemed like it was a regular acceptance. Right, right. So when you said what you said just now, Doc, and describing a lack of, of education, I believe that white pathology mm. uh, ideologies control the rule my thinking because mm. I didn't even know who the hell I was. Right. That's right. That's right. Mm. See, mm. to participate in such destructive behaviors in the community and then still participate in those same sort of behavior while incarcerated, mm. I had to really psychoanalyze myself. Right. That's right. Mm. And the only way that you're able to do that, make mm. that transition, man, is you look at yourself and mm. you be real. Right. That's right. That's right. Mm. You can't be faking. Right. Mm. You got to be real. Mm -hmm. So uh, what you said in the presentation yesterday was so beautiful, man, mm. and how you showed the 10 points and how mm. they were applicable, bro. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody appreciated that presentation because you broke it down. And they are the long-term effects that prisoners are going to experience. Right, that's right. Mm -hmm. And those things are going to metastasize mm -hmm. to families, the children, mm -hmm. to the community. Mm -hmm. In some cases, it's going to be good. You got to have patience and understanding what a person went through mm -hmm. because you cannot ignore the developmental mm -hmm. processes of the brain, right. which is the personality of the human being. That's, that's right. a part of my personality. That's right. Mm -hmm. I can't exclude that. Right. That's right. I've been, I was incarcerated for 38 years. I can't exclude that. That's that is a part of my personality. But the way I adapt and mm. make my choices, mm. that's something you can never take from me. That's right. So when when he said what he said to me, mm. I say, oh, yeah. He said, yeah, because you're the only one not back here doing it. Mm. And I say, I'm not going to be the only one that ain't going to be doing it. Right. Right. But one day, a brother was, uh, sweeping the tea and they had a, a book on the tea and I said, man, let me get that book. And it was by Arlene. Mm. 
Dr. R. Lang. And it was, and Dr. R. Lang said in that book, he said, can abnormality appear to be normal in an abnormal environment? Mm. Yes, sir. Yeah. See where you're going. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I meditated on that. Mm. And I said to myself, abnormality in whatever time or whatever mm. environment mm. it's in is mm. still abnormal. That's right. That's right. That's right. Because, like I said, my thinking and mm. my mind was ruled and controlled mm. by white pathology. Right. I read something, so, oh, yeah, I'm going to mm. start doing Oh, yeah, I'm going to start doing that. Mm. But when I start reading Dr. Naeem Akbar, mm. Francis Quest mm. Welsh, That's right, brother. Dr. Henry Clark. Yeah. Right. Or destruction of black civilization, <laughs> Dr. Hunter D.I., yes, sir. The two cradle theory, you know, getting to the matter and getting to various other teachings mm. and philosophies mm. and stuff like that. Mm. Then I could begin to define myself. Right, that's right, that's right. Mm. So, although I realized that my life uh, was traumatized before mm. I even went into the system, right, that's right, that's right. I realized it was traumatized further when I went in there, and I know that post-prison trauma mm -hmm. transfers to family, friends, and everybody. Right, that's right. I come out first with my, my wife, my beautiful wife. I got to give recognition to her. That's right. Mm -hmm. She she nurtured me and played mm -hmm. uh, uh, exercise patients. Mm -hmm. My sisters, my brother, I'm eating all fast. Mm -hmm. I'm doing, hey, it's, uh, in the hypo business right. days. right. And although I had all those teachers up underneath mm -hmm. me, man, when I come out here, man, I thought mm -hmm. <laughs> I went to the candy store. I just yeah. do what I wanted to. That's right. Because I was so in prison. Right, right. And so, like I had read yesterday from that um the history of, of the health, it say man is born free, yet in all over the planet Earth, he's still in shape in change. Right, right. Psychological change. That's it, brother. That's and so, and so, so. Trauma is 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 uh as it pertains to long term effects of prisoners, it's so real, mm. but yet it's so misunderstood. Yes, yes. And there's a lack of information uh, applicable to it mm. because that's a, when I was in, when I was in school and I was doing research. Uh, my my teacher, Doctor Legum, and he was a beautiful teacher because he taught me how to do research. And I went to him with my topic, and I said, long-term effects of incarceration on return to adult citizens. That was my topic. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, Mr. Loder, you want to think about changing your topic? I said, no, I don't want to think about changing my topic. He said, well, it's going to be kind of hard because you uh, know that it has to be cases such and such and such a time period. I think it was 20. 2017 on that he was accepted because you had to do 10 research papers right. and incorporate mm -hmm. your research and mm -hmm. put it in structure, design, all that stuff, you know. Uh, so I did the research mm -hmm. and there were no cases. Tell it, bro. Tell it. Pertaining to the research mm -hmm. of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now there were old cases. Right. There were old cases that talk about um that. Mm -hmm. And we know that there's more prisoners in prison than it is people in the mental hospitals, because mm -hmm. that's what they use the prisons for now. Because mm -hmm. you got a lot of brothers in there that are mentally ill. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that mental illness metastasized everybody in that environment. You can't. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. can't avoid it. You, yeah. you and there, you try to say, I'm all right. I know I'm okay. Mm -hmm. But you got a guy right here that's being a nut and annoyances to you because mm -hmm. he's mentally ill. And we don't, you know, so that is metastasized. Mm -hmm. But it's so real. And, and so I keep going back to this educational thing, man, because mm -hmm. that's important, you know, when, when, you talk about long-term experiences when you talk about long-term effects of incarceration and all that. Mm -hmm. It's something that not only affects the person, but it affects the family. Mm -hmm. 
And so the family have to have to come together. They what they what they did, they put a module together. I know I went off that mm-hmm. subject a little bit, but they put the they put a module together. And the module was cognitive behavioral family therapy. Mm-hmm. Where they would bring in everybody. Okay. And and this listen to everybody. Because you could have mm-hmm. trauma right mm-hmm. in the familiar structure mm-hmm. or or aggression or violence. Mm-hmm. And that's right in the familiar structure. Mm-hmm. You got sisters and brothers and mothers and fathers, everybody hating everybody. Mm. But it's all rooted in trauma. Right. So although we just talking about this subject here, about that, mm. I think that it's also interesting in that regard too. Yes, sir. I, I definitely agree. And and one of the things, I mean, because there were so many jewels you dropped, you talked about the family, you talked about the community, right. you talked about the education and peace, you're talking about the white pathology. And there was so much in there to unpack. But I, I want to start with the family. So when we talk about long-term incarceration, you know, again, depending on who you ask, some person may say long-term incarceration began at 10 years or more, Mm. as the brother indicated. When we talk about personalities, and I'm going to give you an example, we know about what we see on TV in terms about the theater of war. Currently, right now, uh, Russia is involved in a conflict with Ukraine. Okay, they're engaged in a war. It's been defined by war. Okay, so then you take that. Now, when you begin to look at it, say the war comes to an end and those soldiers go back to their respective countries, the soldiers in Ukraine, the soldiers in Russia. Now, some soldiers who are going to return back to their respective countries, they're not going to be impacted the same way as the other soldiers, as the brother alluded to. Depending mm-hmm. on your personality type, depend on who you are, depend on your de- developmental, uh, say, exposure. So for you, you, so in Ukraine, or we use the United States, Brothers who came home for the Vietnam War. Many brothers who came home for the Vietnam War, some of the brothers who came home, uh, they experienced, during that time, they called shell shock. You know, the clinical definition is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. But back then, in 70, during the, we would say the Korean War, the Vietnam War, they would call the brother, come home, he was shell shock. So I want you to understand, two men who came from the same, we say West, uh, uh, West Baltimore. They both, you know, in their 60s now, they, they you know they fought during the Vietnam War. One brother got married, you know, became you know involved in the community, uh, had his children. Another brother turned to alcohol, but turned to drugs. Both experienced the same thing: the Vietnam War, the conflict. So what we're talking about, we're talking about that you have two people based on your temperament, based on your personality development, based on your exposure. There, we can experience a similar. We'll say we'll say. The similar reality, the Vietnam War, we both in the jungles of Vietnam, but yet how we respond to that, both how we react to that would be different. So I want to say this about long-term incarceration. Brothers who come home from prison after serving 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and beyond, not every brother is going to come home and going to adapt the same way. But it is unethical, it is inhumane to think that anyone can be in an environment with that length of time and not be impacted by that. Just as the brother who was in Vietnam, even though he's married now, but he still was impacting some some level. It just had to be determined what level he was impacted on. It just some graded alcohol can't get their life together. They're traumatized, and what the brothers alluding to. When we talk about the wet white pathology. We're talking about a as we know, because we cannot get away from the reality that as African people in this country right here, what we have been exposed to. Now, do we have to remain there? Clearly, we do not. But there has to be part of the dialogue because what we have spoke, been exposed to in terms of our enslavement, in terms of Jim Crow, in terms of the civil rights movement, in terms of everything that's taken institutional racism has impacted us, which is a traumatic experience that we all have dealt with. Yes, so sir. now you take that under consideration. Now in a tra- traumatic environment, now you have a father or mother who come up in that same environment because of their processes, because of their personality, don't know how to necessarily cope with that, now they begin to impart that on the child. So we start with the environment is one leg of it. Then from the environment is to you know, the choices that you make until the outcome. So let's look at the family. So here within the family now, a brother come home who's been incarcerated from long term, as he, brother alluded to, doesn't really know because he hasn't been around his family in 20, 30 years. The family really don't know him. So you're learning about each other. He's closer to a brother who's in prison than he with his own maybe biological brother. Because he literally grew up with that man in prison. Where his brother, you know, maybe occasional phone visit or co- contact visit. But for the 20 years, he's been around his brother in prison each and every day. So he know more about him 
Then, but I'm in the same situation with my own biological brother. The men I was in prison with, I know more about them, closest in many ways in terms of, of who we are. Them all, but I love my biological brother, but I don't know them the same way I know this brother right Absolutely. here. So I'm talking about, so we talk about that long-term effect here. So now you come into the home, the brother shared the story is that uh, the family may see, well, he doesn't talk much. He may, he may go up in the room, isolate himself. Or he may not be as engaging. Now, the brother who comes home, in his mind, in his mind, he's okay. Because, again, using myself as, as, as a case study. I go in my, in my room, I'm in the room, sitting down. My wife says, you okay? I'm really, I'm fine. I'm okay. Now, it, 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 the brother alluded to, it seems I'm not okay because my wife, because now i got to learn how to be engaging with my wife, with my children, with my family members. But now, in terms of am I... Uh, as we say, going through something, I mean, because I've learned how to be within myself, in that cell, by myself, and to many degree, be at peace with myself. To someone outside looking in and saying, what's wrong with that brother right there? Mm. To me, I'm looking at you, I'm okay, I'm good, and I'm really good. So we talk, so the brother brings that home with him. No, the family got to make an adjustment because they, and he he himself or herself has to make an adjustment because now, as, as my queen always told me, you got to come out that cell. In home, in the bedroom, she said, you got to come out that cell. And that was a very powerful observation she made because you can be sitting at home in your house you know, with your family and you in that cell because of what you have been conditioned over 20, 30, 40 years, how you've lived, that just don't go anywhere. So how do you come out of that cell, me mentally, and, when, and I'm going to turn it, get back to y'all, but I wanted to bring that up when we talk about how the family's impacted because I really want us to understand what we're dealing with. And one of the most powerful things that, one of the many things I read within the Bible, what Jesus Christ talked about, he said, oh, you shall know the truth, and it's the truth that set you free. Well, Yahya was alluding to, until you're ready to face that part, educationally, the politics, uh, the criminal justice system, the, the, no, no, the clinician, no, the mental health system, until we're ready to face the true reality of what has happened place, we're forever going to be enslaved by what we're having today. And I'm, I'm a I'm, I'm going to touch on the abnormal people, but I'm, I'm going to write up what Lorraine, when you talk about the white pathology, when you talk about uh, the ab, you know, can, ab, can abnormality seem normal within a, um, you know, within a, an abnormal value. It's happening all around us. Mm. Because oftentimes, we, many times we say, many times we say that, uh, you know, we normalize somebody being murdered, somebody being attacked, somebody, we've normalized to the degree that we think that's, you know, but see, that's something that's let's know. It's not right, but we've normalized it where it don't even phase us anymore. And see, and see, and see the edge of that. Um, what I gathered from what Dr. Lang was saying also is that that's what that's what that's it, it applied to a prison reality, mm -hmm. it applied to the societal reality we're mm -hmm. in now. Is is abnormality considered normal in an abnormal environment so if you got if you got 15 or 20 people that's participating mm. in abnormal behaviors mm. it's saying is that normal mm. <laughs> is, is it normal right that's right that's right in that environment mm. and i was in that environment and i'm mm. saying i don't care what you say mm. it's still abnormal that's right that's right see because pathology is in thinking mm. Pathologies and thinking, that's where the disease is at, right in your thinking. Mm -hmm. The way that you think and your perception actually rule and control your behavior. Mm -hmm. So biological behaviors are what not taken into consideration and the damage that is done. Like mm -hmm. you were saying, when you talk about sleeping disorders, eating disorders, and other behavioral disorders. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why it's essential that a biopsychosocial uh, tool is used, meaning that you understand that behaviors can only be controlled by mm -hmm. biological, psychological, or social factors. Right. So if you got people that's in their thinking, in their thinking, it's either they're ruled by biology, they ruled by psychology, or they're ruled by social forces. Right, that's right. And so when we when we look at when we're looking at um long term prisoners returning back to the community, uh, that's 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 what they uh you have to do that's what that's what majority of them that we deal with uh, mm -hmm. have done and i'm not saying 
the challenges don't come because right. the bells still go off. We right. still have right. episodes. I went in uh, to see my sister. And uh, when I walked in there, I said, uh, man, this smell like. Mm, come on. Shit and piss. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But it was flashback mm. for me being where I yeah. come from. Yeah. You know, that smell. Trig it triggered that, that, right? That's it. That's it. So the thing about it is that although you, although you, um, you, 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 you survive that, mm. you still have to continuously mm. use uh, approaches mm. in dealing with those type of triggers. Mm. And uh, doing some uh, training, this is a little bit, not off the subject, but well, doing some training that I had uh, attended, you had two, uh, uh, the director from uh, New York, New Jersey, it was a JAPS training. Mm -hmm. It was a uh, leadership training. And you had a director, uh, and I had, uh, along with the team, went up to New York, New Jersey to train them because they deal with the same population mm -hmm. we deal with, adult returning to adult citizens. And he said to me that they had a group that they meet with all people coming out of the prison system, and they call it criminomics. Mm -hmm. So I said, criminomics? He said, yeah. He said, you have alcoholic anonymous, mm -hmm. you have uh, uh, NA anonymous, right. uh, narcotic anonymous. Mm -hmm. He said, we're criminomics. I said, well, what's that? He said, because the same way mm -hmm. that they can convert back and relapse mm -hmm. into behavior mm -hmm. is the same way we can relapse and go back to the prison That's structure. Right. That's right. So they sit around, and they talk about those things, and they find out what people need. Mm -hmm. Man, I need those shoes. Everybody go in their pockets, mm -hmm. they assist each other, and they mm -hmm. build that type of brotherhood. Mm -hmm. And I say these were the type of things that uh, mm -hmm. was happening when I first come home, when we would be down at the Hope Center. Lomax was running that Hope Center, mm -hmm. where all the guys would come together. We'd sit around, we'd talk about those things, and see if everybody mm -hmm. was okay. No one knows whether they're going to succumb to those triggers. Right, that's right. And you had a few brothers that did succumb to mm. those triggers in, mm. in, in, in different ways, right? Some of them OD, mm. come out with the same behavior, some of them OD, some of them went back to, to, mm. to the jail, but they still was doing things, but they still traumatized. Right. right. So that's what, I, that's what I mean. Education to me, man, is the key to it all. Mm -hmm. And once uh, families can sit down, and loved ones can sit down mm -hmm. and they can sit down and understand and come up with some strategies mm -hmm. and techniques to deal with how this thing really affect uh, their loved ones that's returning back to them. But I think that would be the key to it all, especially if the person now, especially if the person is on point with itself. That's the main key. Right. If, you ain't got, if you ain't got your thing together, mm -hmm. then you don't have no family support. Right. Now, they're not even going to try to, but they're going to be traumatized right. by it. And see, so, like I said, trauma is, is to me, uh, aside from all the other definitions, it's just an interruption in your cognition. Mm -hmm. Your cognition being your thinking. Right, right. And when that has an impact on your structure, on your biology, you know, in mm -hmm. your brain, mm -hmm. right? And it, and it just don't rest in this part of your brain, mm -hmm. the part that thinks, the part right. that reads mm -hmm. and rest, you know. So, yeah. No, that's that's that, that's what's it. And again, the brother touched on a couple of things I wanted to follow up on. One is the brother when he talked about going to New Jersey and meeting the uh, brothers up there who doing similar work, and they formed what they call what it was a, a prim anonymous. See, one of the things the brother now we've shared, you know, that that we talked about very the same thing. And one of the things that that I'm working on that I put together, I call it transition anonymous. You know, I was thinking about. I even use some of the same words, you know, what's one called a crime anonymous, because again, word is words are powerful. I, I like to use the word transition because we're in a transitional state. But one of the key things he said is absolutely true is, and I shared it yesterday, is that the approach is just like the, the uh those who are in a and a alcohol, um, no, alcohol anonymous and narcotic anonymous, is that you have to work on they have to work on their sobriety. They are taught to work on their sobriety and their addiction every day. And I shared that with someone who's been incarcerated, who's been imp impacted by incarceration, say, you know, in a psychological kind of way. You have to work on your rehabilitation each and every day. As I say, I'm 27 years clean being on, you know, being out of prison. 
and I work on my uh, rehabilitation each and every day because I know the brother talk about those triggers. So let's kind of go a little bit deep into that. Your brother, when he was talking about the thinking, he's talking about the prefrontal cortex. So I'm going to get a little clinical with you right now. The prefrontal cortex, this is that part of your brain right here where your prefrontal cortex is located. That's called the executive part of your brain. This is where you make your rational decision or it become irrational. It becomes irrational when you begin to experience trauma. Now you talk about the hippocamp the hippocampus or talk about the amygdala. When we talk about the hippocampus, we're talking about we're talking about that part of the brain that where everything that you have experienced in your life is stored in that part of the brain. Then we talk about the amygdala. The amygdala that where we talk about long-term and short-term memory. So the brother talked about a trigger. I know exactly what he talked about. I can go in certain buildings and it came back to 1972 inside of a jail. It has a similar smell that it's been it's been 40 years since I smelled. But I can go walk into a building, smell that smell, and all the magic trigger me. That smell just like the jail, man. That's a trigger. Okay, what he's talking about. Also, that trigger is gonna be a sound. I can watch something on TV, you know, and and it can, there's a scene in the wire. Kind of there's a scene in the wire, and I can't think of the brother name, but uh, there's a scene in the wire to where this guy, you know, you no, know, they were shooters, and they were trying to recruit this young guy to be a shooter. But the young guy said, "Well, look, I was joining the team, but I got this old head who'd been messing with me." What the young boy was saying was the old head that came back from prison had turned the young boy out. So the shooter approached him, and 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 confronted him on that, and the shooter and the shooter took a brick. And he beat the boy. But what happened was his partner was witnessing that, realized that he was beating that man, but he was beating something inside of him. Possibly he had been touched because the way he beat that man, it was more than what that, you know, going beyond what the young boy said. But just experiencing that, it triggered something in me because being in that environment and witnessing that kind of behavior, that was a trigger. So it can be a smell. It can be a thought. It can be a sound that can trigger something within your trauma if you're not dealt with. So the brother, again, is right on point with that. So that's very key when we talk about understanding that. So when we're on the bus stop, you know, and they're a young kid or an old head or something, they act in a certain way, and they act in a certain way that whereas you may not be familiar with, just keep in mind that when you deal with trauma, you're talking about a psychological, say, a deterioration, if you will, that where the stress of carrying not dealing with that burden of trauma, it begins to weaken your ability to make rational decisions. So now you make impulsive decisions, you make irrational decisions because that part of the brain has been weakened by the stress of the trauma. And that impacts the brain, which because without this part of the brain functioning in the way which governs the ability to debate, do I shoot this old lady or do I not shoot this old lady? And when this is what I'm saying is, is that, so that part of the brain, but it comes through education. Educating, understanding that we're no, it's more than just saying, you know, we will put them on probation. We'll put an ankle, well, no, we'll put that box on their leg. We got to begin to address this in a deeper way, in an educational way, an informed way, you know, on, on, no, on, no, on, 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 on many levels. I would say on, on many social levels, education, uh, uh, criminal justice, you no know, public health, you no know, diet. It's, 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 it, it, no, it incorporates all of that. So I'm glad you shared that, Yai. I want to, I want to mm -hmm. say uh, also that I think that you hit that right on key <laughs> when you say undiagnosed, undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I say that because I've read, I mean, I've read psychology, man, going back to the history of psychology. That's, that was my, um, that was my passion. That's what I, I believe that when I was reading psychology, uh, the Carl Jung theories, mm -hmm. the stall, uh, Victor Frankl, the one that was in the prison, lost his uh, family, and when they developed the local therapy, I think right. those local therapy techniques also helped me uh, while I was incarcerated because it's one thing that they they can take everything from. You. But it's one thing that they can't take, and that's your mind. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the logo therapy was that although you face with although you face with all these traumatic experiences in your soul journey, mm -hmm. you don't allow those to, to make you surrender to that type right. of behavior, right. right? But you said it, Keith, when you said it's an undiagnosed problem. 
in your book. Right. So it's undiagnosed. And it is. It's undiagnosed. Uh, like I said, when I was doing the research paper, and I heard all that, when I was doing the research paper, I took that, that, that paper back to Dr. Uh, Lehman. And I got an A out there, out there class. But it was 10 cases that were so old. Mm -hmm. I told him, I said, that's my topic and I'm not going to change my mm -hmm. topic. Mm -hmm. And I got an A out there at that place. Mm -hmm. But there's no research on what you saw yeah. about this yeah. undiagnosed. Yeah. And that's the reason being, but yet it's the factor that controls mm -hmm. this behavior. That's right. That's right. That's right. You see, you, know, you, you, you got uh, people that are uh, bureaucratic in their approaches to, mm -hmm. um, to, to uh, behavioral science. And anything that you come up with that's new or they think it's going to fall into accepted behaviors, mm -hmm. right? They say it's not accepted. Right? Right. 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 It's all in the behavioral science, all in the clinical fields mm -hmm. and everything. So when you talk about something outside of that, mm -hmm. they don't want to hear that. Yeah. Right? But I say, who the hell was these guys? Right. They're not even alive no more. Mm -hmm. Yet we talked about Moses mm -hmm. Being coming in here, would Moses be able to adapt to this? <laughs> yeah, with Noah, yeah, yeah, yeah. or Abraham, mm -hmm. or Joshua? Would yeah. they be able to adapt yeah. if they was in this current yeah. Yeah. So human behavior is evolution, and right. human behavior change. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the psychological concepts that mm -hmm. you think is applicable to mm -hmm. human behavior, mm -hmm. it's not really applicable yeah. to human yeah. behavior. Mm -hmm. That's why you got so many modules. Right. Right. That's right. That's you got right. so many modules about this, about that, about this is the cause of this, this is the cause of that. I say once you educate yourself, mm -hmm. that's the key. Mm -hmm. And like you say, it's undiagnosed. It's an undiagnosed behavior, but it's a behavior that continues to rule right. and control. That's right. that's right, that's right, that's right. And the thing about it, the thing about it, the thing about it is that all these other concepts that's been applied, it definitely is in application, in application. It's not effective. Right, right, right. It's right. not. Mm -hmm. These behavior modules that they're currently using mm -hmm. in these places, they're not effective mm -hmm. because you continuously see the same, same patterns of behavior. Huh. That's it, that's it. Bro. So, how the hell can you wake up expecting something different mm -hmm. from something that you don't can't change? Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, the behavior patterns, mm -hmm. I mean, the approaches, the strategies, mm -hmm. all of them. Mm -hmm. And then, like I said, the only way it's going to work is they understand the biological mm -hmm. and psychological effects mm -hmm. of not only incarceration, but mm -hmm. the biological and psychological effects that mm -hmm. apply to humanity. Right, right, right. Period. Mm -hmm. From an educational perspective. Mm -hmm. Educate the people, man. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's not what's that. All they do is cycle back. Mm -hmm. All they do is put big, big words. Mm -hmm. I don't know these words when I, I have to research. Every two to lines, that's I have right, to stop right, right. and write down something and search what the heck I'm reading. Right, that's right. And if I don't do that, then I'm understanding in fragments. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So communicate in a language that they understand it and understand the effects of incarceration, understand the negative effects of this, understand this, and how it affects family, mm -hmm. children, society. Understand it, but understand it from an educational form. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's real, bro. That's, uh, you know that's very powerful what you said and and and, and it's so you know it's, it's apparent to us and one of the things that you know that i would add to that is saying that yesterday at the conference i talked about the brother dr wade noble who had coined the phrase when he, when he defined power and he said and i would share with you know the audience here Dr. Wade Nobles defined power as having the ability to define reality and convince you that it is your reality. And what is happening to us as African people, unfortunately, and, and on a global level in many respects, is that our reality has been defined for us. Now, I want to tell you what, what Bro Yah is saying. You know, we talk about Sigma Freud, we talk about Carl Jung, we talk about skin, we talk about all of those uh, uh, mental health psychiatrists, psychologists, behavior people who you know, within their, uh, you know, you know, within their theory they created was relevant. Uh, it, it had the place, say, within the field of mental health. And and like myself, being an eclectic person, I can take from a fraud. 
when we talk about psychoanalysis. I can take from a Skinner. I can take from a Carl Jung, and I can use it. But the reality of it is this right here. In 2022, and even before then, as African people, what we have experienced, who are developing the theories around those realities that where now we're coming up with modules, we're coming up with treatment, we're talking about with prevention, we're talking about with research that begin to address those issues that was born out of the pathology of our institutional racism. Because many of the personalities that you're, I will go, I will argue, the personality that you're seeing today within the inner cities, across the board, across the United States, these are personalities that has been created by institutional racism. I was not born to rob. I was not born to murder. I was not born to rape. But something happened in my experience that where now something was lacking within my environment that created the personality that is within me. So that is the institutionalized experience that's happened that where now within myself, I've given way to a part of myself that allows me now to go in this store, in my neighborhood, pick up a pistol and rob this person. I wasn't born like that. So what has happened? And this is what, again, what the brother is alluding to is that when we talk about education, but also talking about how do we begin to look at our behaviors, you know, like Brother Young, like a, a Dr. Dennis Lassar right here, who's beginning, now who's, who's thinking about these now in a deeper kind of way, and a person said, well, no, wait a minute, we, we got to re-examine this thing right here, because we're thinking men. We're thinking men. And we, and we understand that, and one of the things I always say is, you can't define for me. You can hit me in my face. But now, if I say that it hurts, that whatever happens, you say, you, no, it doesn't, that's, that's not your experience. You can't define that for me. What I'm saying to the American people is that what we have been subjected to, no one can define our experience for us. We have to begin to define what interest racism has done to us, what uh, the, break, uh, the broken family has done to us, the absent father has done us, what the drug. We have to begin to define that within our reality. But it's going to take men like Brother Young, men like uh, Brother Dennis Assault, you know, the sisters out there, you know, like the, the Mama Harmonies of the world, or uh, the sisters out there like, uh, you know, the Dr. Friends, Chris Wells, you know, God bless us so, the Marimba, our niece who's saying, well, look, there's something going on inside of us that we're not addressing, but we have to look outside of what, now we can learn, take what's already been established with those institutions, but it has, we have to begin to take the lead on that because, you know, the, the brother Shea Gante D. Out. You no know, the transition, you know, and what he left. Uh, Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, what he left. So who's picking the baton up now, the new generation, and begin to move it forward in a way that begin to really affect change? You know, we got some brilliant minds. We got some young minds. A shout out to the uh, Brother Elijah and then the Tandale family. I'm saying, so we have people work within the community, but yet, again, how to begin to collectively begin to address these issues because our reality can no longer be defined by other people. But look, I experienced that in my study, doing research about African-American men. In, that was very little research. Brother Dennis Assar, Dr. Assar, in his research, looking for research articles, journals to you know to use within, in his study, very limited research because the research is not there because it hasn't been an issue. And I'm going to add this right here and get, turn and give it back to y'all. I want you to think about public health and public safety. You can take the word public and you take the word Public by itself, you can add public safety and the crack epidemic, the drug epidemic, it becomes a war on drugs, it becomes a war, unfortunately, on, on, on black and brown people, just by the simple word public safety. You can take that same word public, remove the word safety, and put public health, and, and the overdose is being done within the white communities on meth, and what was the other drug that's uh, fentanyl off, now become a public health issue, just simply by changing the word. From public safety to public health. What I'm advocating for is that right now we remove the word public safety as it pertains to black men, the black community, black women in the black community in terms of mental health, and put the word public health up there. Now we get it be you, the dog go into research, it goes into treatment, it goes into prevention, it goes into education just by simply changing the word. But if you target a population and you say this particular population has is more aligned with public safety, then becomes incarceration. It becomes juvenile, more juvenile uh, justice uh, cent uh, 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 detention centers. It becomes, you know, uh, you know, disparity, you know, in, you know, in, 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 into sentencing. So it's a matter of the dialogue, but it's also a matter of who is defining our reality for us in this particular time. And this is what the brothers are alluding to. Brother Yah, 
And uh, I, 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 I recall reading a, a book by Dr. Wilson. And in the book, Dr. Wilson was going back to the Genesis chapter. Mm -hmm. And he said, who defined words define your reality? Huh. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. That's what he was saying. Yeah. And I meditated on that. So when I said that, I believe that I believe that um, we are controlled by a white uh, mythology. Mm -hmm. I met it in this context that from the DMS one mm -hmm. all the way mm -hmm. to five, mm -hmm. it's been controlled by your opinions. That's, That's right. right. That's it's right. Been defined by mm -hmm. your opinions. Mm -hmm. All the mental health mm -hmm. behaviors were defined by your opinions. And so whoever defined can also justify because mm -hmm. they attempt to justify homosexuality mm -hmm. and uh, normal forms, uh, abnormal forms of behavior mm -hmm. as being normal forms of behavior. And I, I don't have nothing against nobody. Mm -hmm. I ain't homophobic. I ain't none of that. You know, it's just mm -hmm. not my style. Right. right. And so, and I don't frown on it. You mm -hmm. know, I'm treated as human beings. I just know that... Um, Whoever defined it, right, 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 is, is, is saying it is known, right, and they accept it, right. right, and they go back to that abnormality thing that I had it could never be known to me, mm -hmm. even in terms right. of it being shared by a certain population. So, pathology also is is the the, the strategies and classifications of what they define the behavior, right, right. right. that's right. right. And we go by that. Mm -hmm. We be use these concepts. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's good for us. It's good for us, I believe, to 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 be to be aware of the Black Psychology Association. Right. right. That's right. It's good for us to read uh, 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 information like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's good to do that. Richard King is my champion. Mm -hmm. When you talk about that, you talk about the biological mm -hmm. aspects, get into the cranial plan. You mm -hmm. have the same ancestral abilities and powers as I look around mm -hmm. that your your forefathers had. That's right. That's those right. essence and those qualities are you. You're a king. Yeah, yeah. And the queen. Mm -hmm. And then so so that's what I meant when I said that. You know, we have to we have to dethrone mm -hmm. or relinquish mm -hmm. the white pathology. That's right. And establish definitions centered around our own culture and ethnicity. Right. Because that's what define the people. Right. I mean, I speak the bastardized language of English. Mm -hmm. I don't even know my native tongue. Right. That's right. So, and I know, I know I'm speaking genetically and generationally wise, mm -hmm. but we, we know, we know what, what's going on down that, that line. Right? That's right. You know right. about the state. Mm -hmm. You got to even come with the Draper man. It was abnormal for you to even think about running right. away. That's uh -huh. right. Mm -hmm. It's an abnormal. You got an abnormal mm -hmm. condition, and hey, well, that would have been one that I would have had. <laughs> That's, right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Definitely would have had it. So that the whole point, Doc, is the points that you're making are so uh, germane and irrelevant to to what you talked about. Uh, like I said, I just don't want to limit to long-term mm -hmm. right. incarceration mm -hmm. when you talk about human behavior right. That's as right. it applies to our people, as That's it right. applies to the things that we see, that we mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And that uh, so uh, I'm making remarkable adjustments mm -hmm. with my family. Like I say, I still have low trauma mm -hmm. or experiences. Something might trigger off. I right. say, I can't, man. Mm -hmm. So I say, no, baby, mind. Yeah. Because I went back there. Right. Uh -huh. But I know what I have to do. Mm -hmm. I can't let the past rule my current lifestyle. That's right. That's deep, brother. Um, looking at the clock family, it's you know, it's left 11. Uh, Dr. Dennis Asari has always been gracious enough to allow me to use this time, so I don't want to take advantage of brother's time. It's an hour show, but I'm definitely glad that we had this opportunity, bro. Y'all came on and blessed us with his information, with his wealth of knowledge, with his experience, and I definitely hope something has been shared with you this morning that you can take that, you know, can add that to your toolbox. To help maybe you cope better with yourself, with a family member. And as I've shared, you know, definitely, you know, share this video, you know, with a friend, you know, subscribe to this page. Y'all, any closing words you want to send to the say to the people? I just want to, I just want to say that I hope that um you 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 have a better understanding mm -hmm. of someone who uh has been incarcerated for a long time, mm -hmm. coming back to the community, to his family, to his friends. Mm -hmm. 
that you may, if you don't understand, man, just educate yourself mm -hmm. about it. You see some things about it, just help them along the way. Mm -hmm. Express that they're trying to stay on the right path. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so, uh, again, as long as you have the capacity to think mm -hmm. and practice, you can become a better human being regardless of the past experiences. No one can define your shoes, no one can define what you experience in life, no one can understand you unless they walk into your shoes. Right. But don't close yourself off. Mm -hmm. Don't close yourself off. Share love, mm -hmm. grow, become more positive and productive by restructuring, reframing and thinking, becoming better. I appreciate that, y'all. Again, thank you, my brother, for taking the time out your weekend and being here. Um, I would just say, um, again, to the people out there, I want you, you know, if you haven't already, take a moment to go to YouTube, look at uh, A Moment with Harmony, with Harmony Davis. Uh, she's definitely continued to bless uh, us with, you know, with her, her insight and vision in terms of self-healing. You can benefit men and women. So shout out, shout out to you, Harmony, for what you're doing. Uh, continue to do the work. Shout out to Elijah and the Tendale family for what the brothers are doing in the community. You definitely reach the Tendale family, uh, uh, you know, get a little bit more information about them. Again, brother, sorry. T-Net Holistic Wellness Center right here, what the brothers are doing. The brothers, the brother is a beautiful brother. Uh, the brothers continue to grow and continue to add to the community. You know, as pump in, like you can see probably in the background, the books, you know, the defenses. There's many things. There's something within the culture that, is, that you can come here and, and begin to say, well, look, I can benefit from this. So definitely reach out. But also the brothers, you know, you know, he's a therapist. He's a doctor. So he's definitely doing big things. Myself, you, know, you can reach out to me, uh, Fred Share. Uh, 112194gmail.com. You want to hear more about the work that I'm doing with Men Behind Bars. And definitely, I appreciate your time. Thank you all for tuning in this morning. I'm looking forward to another uh, bullpen conversation. It's been a great experience. Take care, everybody. Looking forward to seeing you guys. Inshallah, have a great week. Be safe. Mass up. Take the shots. Whatever it is, do your research. Be informed. We call the pandemic is real. It's definitely real. And from what I'm hearing, that there's still, uh, there's another generation uh, of, I guess, of, 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 of viruses coming out. I think it was over in, in I want to say London, England, is making its way to the United States. So again, we're not at the woods yet. We're better than where we were, I want to believe, but definitely not at the woods yet. So definitely continue to take care of yourself. Just uh, have a great and safe weekend. Inshallah, I'll see you guys again next month. Uh, another conversation inside the bullpen.